Yes, whenever you are. All right, sounds good. Okay, everyone, thank you for joining us today at HMSC's research seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffitt, and I'm the research program manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, located in Newport, Oregon. Um, I will be your host for today. Uh, if you, you're new to our seminar series, you will notice that your mics, cameras, and screen shares have been turned off, but we do ask that you put in questions at any time today. Um, into the chat box, which you can find at the bottom or the top of your screen. And our speaker today will answer them um, when it's appropriate uh, as they come in. So please feel free to ask those questions and make this as interactive as possible for our speaker. Uh, I also wanted to let folks know we are recording today's event. So if you are interested in re-watching today's seminar or sharing it with others or even seeing seminars of the past. I'm putting the chat in or putting the link into the chat now. Um, so you're welcome to go check that out. Give me a few days to get this seminar posted, but it will be there um, hopefully by Monday um, and feel free to share that. I wanted to uh, just do a quick announcement for next week, August 12th. We have Alejandro Fernandez Ahu from um, the Marine Mammal Institute GEMS Lab uh, here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center will be given a seminar entitled uh, The Application of Novel Methods in Conservation Physiology to Understand the Cases of Large Whale Mortality. Um, and Alejandro is a postdoc that has joined us this summer. So please come join us um, and welcome Alejandro to Hatfield. Um, if you want more information about any of our upcoming events, if you Google HMSC, go to our homepage, scroll to the bottom, uh, there's a calendar of events there and you can get all the links that you need to know. Um, if you joined us early, you heard me talking to Laura, I'm still trying to find a few more seminar speakers for September. So if you or anybody you know, you would like to have them speak to us, uh, please reach out to me and we'll try to get them on the schedule. Uh, we've really enjoyed having folks uh, be able to interact with us via Zoom. It's really broadened our reach and broadened our ability to talk to folks that maybe can't travel. So think about those folks that you have interacted with um, professionally and uh, let me know if you'd like them to uh, speak and we'll figure out how to get them connected. Um, but for today, let me tell you a little bit more about our speaker. Laura Lilly is a new postdoctoral scholar at OSU and NOAA, working with Lorenzo, Mary, and Kim Jacobson. Uh, Laura received her PhD from Scripps Institute of Oceanography, where she studied the variability of zooplankton communities of the Southern California current system in response to El Nino. Prior to graduate school, Laura graduated with a joint bachelor's and master's degree from Earth Systems of Stanford University, and then completed a California Sea Grant State Fellowship with the West Coast Ocean Observatory Systems and the West Coast Governors Alliance. She has also previously held summer internships with the Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center in Honolulu, and has sailed on several seagoing trips with the Sea Education Association, both as a student and a scientist. In addition, these are her words, in addition to running away to the sea and nerding out on zooplankton, Laura is obsessed with surfing, horse polo, wave photography, and kiteboarding. So welcome, Laura, to today's seminar, and the floor is yours. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Cinnamon. I didn't know you were going to say the last part, but thank you very much <laughs> um, for that nice introduction and the invitation to speak today, and thank you, everyone, for joining me. Um, so as Cinnamon mentioned, I'm Laura Lilly, and I'm a new postdoc um, with Oregon State and the NOAA Northwest Lab. And I'm working primarily with Kim Jacobson, Mary Hunziker, Lorenzo Cinelli, um, and also many others, Jennifer Fisher and others at NOAA and Oregon State. Um, and I'm looking forward to further developing those collaborations and also building others. And um, so I most recently came from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where I completed my PhD in March. And um, I am going to be speaking today about some of the work that I did for my dissertation and then also some of my current postdoc work. And all of this work um, relates to the topic of analyzing physical drivers of seasonal and interannual zooplankton variability across various sectors of the California current system. So let's see. We can get an advance here. There it is. Oh, okay. So we know that short term zooplankton community shifts are common in the California current system. This is nothing new. Many of these shifts have been described in the past and they can take uh, various forms. 
So we can see changes in total zooplankton biomass and abundance. Um, generally, we note when total zooplankton decreases, but we can also see significant e increases in zooplankton. We can also see changes in um, proportions of different species. So again, generally we note when our resident or cooler water species decrease and we see increases in subtropical species, but we can also see su substantial increases in cooler water species. And we also note uh, appearances of unusual taxa. And I don't think I need to give an introduction to this crowd about pyrosomes, um, which have been appearing with much frequency over the past five to seven years. But so we, we see many instances of all of these changes and we often see them in relation to um, notable physical changes in the system. We, I think we tend to think most of El Nino events or El Nino-like events like our recent warm blob of 2014-15, but we also, we also know about substantial seasonal variability in the ocean um, and we can see zooplankton changes in relation to that. And so in, I always like to start with kind of the end question of why should we even understand zooplankton? Why does it matter whether zooplankton change? And I think about it in terms of this very simple flow um, in that if we, if we can understand the patterns of zooplankton changes and kind of how and when and why, we can use those to start to identify the mechanisms that are causing changes to the zooplankton community. And if we understand those mechanisms, then we can um, start to make predictions about future changes to zooplankton and allowing or enabling us to make future predictions allow us to, allows us to better manage a lot of the things that we do related to the California current. So things like our fisheries management, um, obviously fish to some, at some level are dependent on zooplankton. Also protected species management, a lot of whale and seabird species forage directly on certain zooplankton and so they can change their distributions and their, their foraging patterns, depending on what um, zooplankton are doing. And that can kind of bring them into greater contact with humans. And then um, as a result, we also need to manage our own activities, things like where we place shipping lanes, how we kind of adjust those throughout the year and, and between years based on where some of these, um, where some of these higher trophic levels are going. And so again, I don't think any of this is new to this crowd, but I really bring it up because um, please contact me if you're working on things related to, to these um, activities, or if you have ideas for how we can sort of better integrate zooplankton into informing some of these management activities. Um, I obviously come from the zooplankton side, but I'm always trying to bridge across to how to make zooplankton more informative to some of these other um, activities. So again, please contact me if you have any thoughts or ideas. So that was the why, and now I'm gonna step back and talk about how we can identify the mechanisms that impact zooplankton. And for this, I, I come back to these physical perturbations, which I call this form of natural variability and that they're, they're sort of producing these natural experiments with the ocean that we can use. Um, they're doing things like changing advection, changing how currents are moving and kind of which currents are strongest, and they're also changing the in-situ habitat conditions that zooplankton experience. And so again, I'm coming back to these, these two types of physical perturbations, and I'm gonna focus on these two um, segments today. So these short-term events or interannual events, these are what I really focused on for my PhD thesis. I'll be talking predominantly about these and then for my postdoc, I'm currently looking at uh, seasonal variability and some of these seasonal cycles. And so I'll talk more briefly at the end about those. And I always like to, or I always have in the back of my mind this question of longer term changes, longer term habitat changes, and also longer term zooplankton changes. And I'm not going to talk about that at all today, but if you're interested in that, again, uh, feel free to come talk to me about that. I have seen some pretty intriguing trends in some uh, sectors of the zooplankton over the long term. So before I dive in, just briefly, how do physical changes alter zooplankton? And I, I think about this in terms of this kind of simplistic dichotomy. And the first way that physical changes can alter zooplankton is by population advection into or out of a region of interest. So here I have a map of California and Baja California and I've outlined in pink the Southern California current region. Um, and so 
um, depending on changes in infection and changes in the strength of currents, some species may be transported out of a region while others can be transported into the region. And then the other main mechanism is in situ mortality or reproduction of existing populations. So if we think again about the same region, uh, things like upwelling or changes in upwelling can change um, temperatures, can change oxygen levels, chlorophyll levels, also things like heat fluxes between the ocean and the atmosphere. All of these can really vary the in situ habitat conditions that sort of existing species experience. And some species can benefit while others um, may be negatively impacted. So these are kind of the two main mechanisms of zooplankton change that I focus on. And I will note that, that um, there is a third main mechanism of, of competition and predation by higher trophic levels. And I sort of chose not to focus at all on that um, for my, particularly for my PhD work. It's obviously, those are very important processes and things I'm interested in, but for now I'm kind of shoving those aside. So these are the main two I'm focusing on. So for the first part, again, this is work I did for my uh, PhD dissertation, and this is really focusing on interannual events and specifically variability in Southern California current system zooplankton during El Nino events. And again, this crowd probably doesn't need much of an introduction to El Nino, but El Nino events develop in the equatorial Pacific Ocean, but they can also have substantial impacts on the California current system. And I think most of us are familiar with this classical El Nino, um, which is where, where you see very strong, warm sea surface temperature anomalies across the equatorial Pacific and reaching all the way to South America. And there's this, usually this correspondingly strong uh, temperature change in the California current system. But as we've um, as we've monitored and sort of witnessed more El Nino events, we've come to realize that the physical expressions of El Nino can really vary. And so these classical El Nino events, we now refer to as Eastern Pacific El Ninos because they, um, they tend to reach all the way to the Eastern Pacific off South America. And in contrast, um, other El Nino events, we can categorize as Central Pacific events because their strongest impacts are more centered on the international dateline in the Central Pacific. And these events tend to be more moderate. They tend to have more moderate impacts um, and also kind of resulting more moderate impacts in the California current. There can be a fair amount of variability between these events. And these two different types also have kind of different physical mechanisms of propagation to the California current. I'm not gonna talk a lot more about the physical manifestations of El Nino, but if you'd like to talk more later, please come contact me. I can talk all day about them. And then we also have things like the warm anomaly, which we now know was not an El Nino event. It, it didn't have a strong equatorial signature, um, but it did have this significant impact in the California current system kind of locally. So we see these varying Nino types and kind of Nino-like events and what these provide is, is kind of a second layer of variability in ocean conditions. So not only do we have El Nino events versus non-Nino events, but we also have different types of El Nino expressions. And all of these lead to variable impacts on physical conditions in the California current system. Um, and um, so that, that variability, again, kind of provides these different scenarios of, of physical change in the California current. And those all have differential impacts on the ecosystem responses. Oh, and if you want to read way more about this, you can check out our recent paper, um, which delves more into, into some of the physical expressions of, of various El Nino events and um, zooplankton responses. Okay, so the data set that I drew upon for my dissertation is our wonderful Cal Coffee data set, the California Cooperative Oceanic Fisheries Investigations. And Cal Coffee samples uh, various subsets of this grid from San Francisco to San Diego. And what we have for zooplankton is an kind of an interannual time series of spring zooplankton uh, samples. So Cal Coffee collects zooplankton four times a year, but they only enumerate the spring samples. And these are bongo collected zooplankton. They're enumerated by microscopy, not by me, by many other wonderful people. Um, 
But we, so we have the spring data set, and for most of the zooplankton taxa, there's only one regionally aggregated or pooled sample um, across the Southern California region. So all of these stations in this kind of blue polygon, their samples are pooled together, and then that sample is um, enumerated. So for most of the zooplankton, we only have this kind of interannual single point time series, but it is across seven decades. So it's still pretty uh, remarkable. So I drew upon this Laura, time series. Oh, yes. There's a question that I didn't get in before you kind of started the next thing, but can you expand? Is the warm anomaly what we know as the blob? Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, Perfect, this thank is you. The warm, it's called the warm blob or the, a lot of people call it the marine heat wave. So 2014, 2013 to 2015 period. Yes. Um, thank you. Okay, so, so my question, the question that I really focused on was how do these El Nino events impact the Southern CCS zooplankton community? And I think about this in terms of four categories. First of all, the characterization of zooplankton changes. So the when and how of change. Second, the mechanisms or the why zooplankton change. Third is about resilience, or basically how long do these El Nino related changes last? And then fourth is, can we make any predictions about the future from these El Nino events? So I'm gonna dive into the characterization here. And here I'm, I'm first showing the total mesozooplankton biomass for the Southern California region. And what I found surprisingly was that total mesozooplankton biomass really shows these inconsistent responses to El Nino events. So, so yes, during some El Ninos, here's the 1998 El Nino, 1958-59, we do see these fairly significant local decreases in biomass. But during other El Nino events, we such as 2016 and the 2015 warm anomaly, we really don't see substantial um, decreases in biomass. And this was somewhat of a surprise to me because I think I was I was sort of used to thinking about El Nino as coming in and totally wiping out the zooplankton of the California current, but um, that's not always the case for this total zooplankton biomass. And in fact, um, I correlated this time series with El Nino indices and, and there wasn't any significant correlation. But in contrast, when I look at some of the taxonomic groups within the total zooplankton, I do see these consistent um, biomass and community changes across El Nino events. So here I'm showing the euphausids or the krill and the calanoid copepods. These are two dominant crustacean taxa, very important prey items. And both of these taxa do show these fairly consistent local decreases in biomass during most El Nino years. I'm, the orange arrows highlight the El Nino events um, where we did see pretty substantial local decreases. And both of these time series do correlate significantly with various El Nino indices. Um, and so that, that really suggests that at these kind of lower levels, we see this consistent El Nino response. And furthermore, for both the calanoids and the euphausids, we have the Calcothes time series has species level enumeration. So I could really look at the, the species level community composition um, within each of these taxa. And what I found was that there were also consistent community shifts or, or species level changes across El Nino events. And so I ran a principal component analysis. Here I'm showing principal component one for the euphausids and two for the calanoids. And then I took both of these principal component time series, I'm showing them here. And you can see that during a lot of major El Nino events with these orange arrows, you see pretty significant um, decreases in these, in these principal component time series or, or changes in the time series. And both of these um, PC time series correlated with El Nino um, indices. So this really shows that that at the species level within some of these dominant taxa, we see these pretty significant El Nino related changes. And then I further looked at whether we saw kind of further differentiation for EP Nino events versus CP Nino events. And the punchline is that for the euphausids, we do see this further EP versus CP um, differentiation. And what I'm showing here is, this is one of my favorite plots, but it's also a little complicated. And, but the main thing to, or the thing to know is that this shows on the y-axis, this shows a metric called percent similarity index, which is basically 
if you look at two years and you look at the proportions of the 24 u faucet species within each of those years, if the proportions of those 24 species are identical, then the two years have a similarity of one. And if the proportions are completely different, they have a similarity of zero. And so what I'm showing here on the x-axis are the 10 El Nino years. And each of these columns of dots is that El Nino year's similarity to all other years in the time series. So here on the left is 1958, and um, all of the orange dots are its similarity to each of these other El Nino events in terms of those 24 Ufausid species. And then the blue dots are its similarity to non Nino years. And the main thing to look for and to take away is that across most El Nino events, the orange dots are higher than the blue dots. So there's kind of more similarity between El Nino years than to non Nino years. So this suggests a sort of distinct El Nino community um, compared to the non Nino community. And then furthermore, if we look at the three EP Nino years, our three strongest El Ninos, we see this kind of even greater change from um, non Nino years. So their similarity to the blue dots to the non Nino years is the lowest of any of the years. And then furthermore, even the, their similarity to other El Nino events, so the CP Ninos, um, is, is lower. So this really suggests that during the EP Ninos, we have this kind of even greater community shift that's actually distinct from the CP Nino community. And then I also looked at this for the calenoids, and I did not see a corresponding nice pattern. There's, there's not this consistent calenoid kind of El Nino similarity. Um, there's just a lot of variability between years. And so even though we saw responses of calenoids to El Nino, they don't seem to always be this kind of distinct El Nino copepod community. Um, and I think the calenoids are also influenced probably more strongly by the PDO and things like that. So from here on out, I'm really focusing on the Ufausids. And it's fortuitous that the Ufausids show such strong El Nino signals because for the Ufausid taxon alone, it turns out that we do have spatially resolved sampling from the Cal Coffee grid. And this is thanks to Ed Brinton, who was a long-standing scientist at Scripps. He was really the father of Ufausids in the Pacific. And he had the foresight to say, that we should continue to enumerate each individual station for its Ufausid um, species, which is really incredible to have. And having this spatial resolution allows us to delve more into some of the potential mechanisms that are causing these Ufausid species changes. So again, I come back to this question of population infection or in-situ responses of different Ufausid species and to get more at this question, I looked at um, the spatial distributions, the habitat ranges, and the developmental phases of some of the dominant Ufausid species. And so I'm going to walk through some of my findings from those and kind of put them together into a picture of hypothesized mechanisms. So first, I am showing my characterization of the spatial distributions, and I'm going to show three Ufausid species. So this first row is Euphausia pacifica, which is our dominant resident Euphausid species. We call it a cool water species. I know that those of you up north don't think of it as quite as cool water, but um, this is, so this is kind of our cool water species. And you can, and I'm sorry, I, these maps are, I took the discrete Cal Coffee samples and I objectively mapped them to get um, kind of smooth distributions from, from those discrete points. And so here on the left is the non Nino distribution, and, and that's averaged across our 58 non Nino years. Then here's the EP Nino distribution in the middle and the CP Nino distribution on the right. And you can see right away that, oh, sorry, that was the wrong way. Um, during EP Ninos, the distribution shows this really extreme coastward compression and uh, poleward compression compared to non-Nino years. So uh, E. Pacifica just really doesn't exist very much in the Southern California Bight and the offshore region. Whereas during CP Ninos, there's a pretty similar distribution to non-Nino years. Um, there's a little coastward and poleward compression in the Southern region, but otherwise pretty comparable. And I think the reason for this 
um, higher max abundance during CP Ninos is just that there were fewer years to average across than for the non Nino distribution. So that's Euphasia Pacifica. Um, next, I looked at Nictiphany simplex, which is a much more subtropical species. I call it a subtropical coastal because it's centered off uh, Baja California to the south. But during EP Ninos, Nictiphany shows this very um, far northward progression, um, still pretty coastally confined, but all the way up to uh, Central California, San Francisco, and it, it has been sampled as far north as Oregon and actually as far north as British Columbia during some of these major EP Nino events. Um, and, and in contrast, during CP Ninos, simplex really doesn't make it past point conception, um, but it does kind of make it to the Southern California Bight and maybe a little bit more offshore. And then the third species is Euphausia jaboides, which I call a subtropical offshore species. It's also centered off Baja California, but displaced offshore. And during EP Ninos, it does show some northward progression, but it, it really doesn't come into this near shore region. Whereas during CP Ninos, um, it does make it all the way to shore. Um, and I should note, and I'm sure you have noted that we have kind of different coverage for the different types of Ninos. And that's because different years of Cal Coffee sampling had different spatial coverage. So there is some spatial variability in the availability of our samples. Um, but, and so we have to take that into account, but even accounting for that, we can see these pretty distinct differences in the EP distributions and the CP distributions from um, the non Nino distribution. So that was the characterization. And then I turned to looking at the habitat ranges of these different species um, during Nino and non Nino years. And so here's Euphasia pacifica. And um, what I'm showing here are the gray bars are its distributions during non Nino years, the pink bars are its distribution during EP Ninos, and then the blue are during CP Ninos and the vertical bars are the corresponding medians. And what is of interest for E. pacifica is that during EP Ninos, we see the shift to cooler temperatures, lower oxygen and higher chlorophyll, all of which are characteristic of upwelling waters. And this may seem a little counterintuitive because I tend to think of El Nino events as kind of reducing upwelling, but if we, we remember the spatial distribution for E. pacifica, we see that it's, it's really confined to only these very near shore waters where there likely is still some coastal upwelling happening. And it's just not at all present offshore, likely because of warming offshore or lower productivity offshore that just make that region um, sort of inhospitable or, or less, less habitable for E. pacifica. And then in contrast, Nictiphany simplex, um, its total population shows relative consistency of ranges across the three Nino types. So there, there aren't sort of these obvious shifts um, in the median distributions between different Nino years. But when we look at only the larval phase, we, we see some offsets from the total population, which is really dominated by the adults. And the larva tend to show or during EP Ninos, they tend to inhabit lower oxygen waters and higher chlorophyll waters, uh, which again are characteristic of upwelling conditions. And so this suggested to me that during these EP Ninos, the, the total population or adults predominantly are being advected north um, to central California, even as far as Oregon. And then they're likely undergoing some in situ reproduction in those upwelling conditions. And so the larvae are being produced in upwelling waters. And you'll note that temperatures during, during EP Ninos, um, the larvae are still inhabiting fairly warm temperatures. And so that may suggest that these upwelled waters are, are slightly warmed enough to, um, for the larvae to sort of be reproduced and survive in them. And I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not going to talk about the Habitat conditions of Euphasia jaboides. You can see our paper if you want to know more about this. But so I stepped through those various um, methods of identifying habitats. And from that, I developed these hypothesized mechanisms for these different species. And so here I have a schematic of the non Nino distributions for those three species. So E. Pacifica is our cool water in blue, Simplex is our subtropical coastal in orange, and then Jaboides is in green. 
And then here in the middle, I'm showing their EP Nino distributions. And I now show um, what I hypothesize to be the, the dominant mechanism for each species. So for E. pacifica in blue, I hypothesized that in situ mortality was really reducing its population offshore and to the south, shown by these blue X's. Whereas Nyctiphany simplex, I hypothesize, is, is really moving northward predominantly via advection, with, but also with, with in situ reproduction in these more northerly uh, regions. And then Jaboides as well um, likely undergoes advection and kind of reproduction within its water mass. And then during CP Ninos, we see kind of differential manifestations, but the same underlying mechanisms. Um, so we still see kind of dominant, or we still see suggestions of dominant mortality for E. pacifica. It's just kind of reduced compared to, e, um, to EP Ninos and, and same with advection of Nyctiphany simplex. Um, and so just to summarize that again, these, these cool water species I hypothesize were mostly responding to El Nino via um, mortality or reduced reproduction. And then subtropical species are responding more by, by transport with advection and um, some potential in situ reproduction. And again, these the sort of the manifestations really vary between EP and CP Ninos and really between different events within each of those categories, um, depending on the sort of individual physical manifestation of each El Nino event. And if you're interested, um, please again see our paper. It really talks through a lot of individual El Nino events and how, how the species kind of, um, you know, show these show these mechanisms across differential physical conditions. And I could spend a whole hour just talking about those findings, but um, that's really all I'm gonna say about that now. Oh, and I will just note, so this is actually the full schematic that I did. And um, so I actually did these for 10 euphousid species and I'm showing them to you in case you have a favorite euphousid, you wanna see where it lines up, but also to show that I did find some coherence of responses across um, species that had kind of similar um, biogeographic ranges. So there, there are several subtropical offshore species and they all show these kind of similar patterns. And that really suggests our ability to develop some coherence of responses across species. So I, I developed these hypotheses for these different eufousid species, but I wanted to, I wanted to be able to test those hypotheses to some extent. And Unfortunately, I, I didn't have um, or there, I didn't have availability of or really time to do. Um, basically, there, there isn't enough availability of growth and reproductive metrics for all of those species for me to build individual based models, and I didn't have time to do it anyway. So I really focused on the question of the individual impact of advection on these different euphousids and species, and to what extent advection alone can really explain. Um, changes in different euphousid species. And I was, I'm now thinking about infection in terms of its transport of populations versus its transport of water masses that may provide favorable habitat for um, in situ species. So kind of these two segments within advection alone. And to look at advection, I drew upon flow fields from the California state estimate which is a regionally optimized subset of the MIT general circulation model. And it's run by Bruce Cornwell's group at Scripps. And so I took those flow fields and um, what I did was I, I kind of identified a subset source flow box for each species. So this blue box is for E. pacifica and it's kind of the region of flow that I expect to most influence E. pacifica across years based on what I know about um, the overall distribution of E. pacifica. And then this orange box is the, the source flow for Nyctivity simplex and the green is for Jaboides. And so I, I averaged the flow within this box, kind of the magnitude and direction across years. And then I compared that to um, the changes in biomass of kind of the, the average changes in biomass of the corresponding species. And uh, what I found was actually some pretty interesting patterns. So what I'm showing here are just Euphausia, Pacifica, and Simplex again. And I'm showing their time-lagged correlations of biomass versus flow. So again, we only have spring biomass, but I correlated that spring biomass, B 
the anomalies of spring biomass for uh, the 10 year period for which we have flow. So 2008 really to 2017. I correlated the that time series of biomass in spring with uh, flows from corresponding spring and then from the five months prior to see if there was a time lag between spring euphausid biomass and the preceding winter to spring flow. And here I'm showing the solid lines are the adult biomass for each species, and then the thin are the calyptopus or the larval biomass for each species. And so you can see for Euphasia pacifica, uh, the adult phase, actually for both species, the adult phase really correlates most strongly with winter flow, the preceding winter. But for pacifica, the larval phase um, correlates most strongly positively with spring flow, so kind of the corresponding spring flow. And this to me suggested that the under favorable conditions induced by favorable flow, these um, species like Euphasia pacifica can really kind of start reproduction um, immediately in response to, to these favorable flows, um, even though the adult populations are kind of doing something else. And I'm, I'm happy to talk more about the adults later. But in contrast, the activity simplex across all developmental phases really shows this consistent correlation with flow. And that to me suggested that um, the species like Nictiphanes really undergo this whole population advection into the region. So all stages are kind of influenced the same by flow. And this does not preclude subsequent in situ reproduction of calyptopes. Um, but to me, it just, it suggests that, that the initial um, appearance in the region is really kind of a whole population advection with favorable flow. Okay, so that is all I'm going to say about that. And I'm very briefly going to touch on resilience to El Nino, because this is a really fundamental ecological question. Basically, when we see these El Nino related changes, how long do they persist? And do we see this kind of rapid bounce back of the community following El Nino events? Or do we see these El Nino related changes? And then do we see this kind of continued proliferation of the El Nino community? And I'm just gonna to cut to the chase. I don't have time to show the actual data, but um, so far we do see this really strong and rapid bounce back of the community or kind of return to pre Nino levels. And that suggests really this evolution of high community resilience to El Nino. Um, I, think, I think this will be a really interesting question into the future. Will we see more of this subtropical persistence, um, particularly as we have more combinations of El Nino and these heat waves. I think that's an outstanding question. But speaking of the future, I also wanted to see if I could identify any, or if I could sort of make any predictions about future changes to zooplankton. So another thing I did with the habitat ranges was I, I developed generalized additive models um, of kind of the best combinations of habitat variables that described each euphausid species. So here I'm just showing Euphausia pacifica and its unique combination of variables that best describe it. But then I took these generalized additive models and I, I re-ran them using forecasted conditions for the year 2100. So literature-based values of, of what our temperatures and oxygen and chlorophyll might be in 2100. And using those reinforced GAMs, I then plotted um, the distributions of abundances in 2100. And what I'm showing are actually the changes in 2100 distribution compared to present for each of the three Nino categories. And there's a lot to that we could look at here and spend time talking about, but I'm just gonna pull out um, the responses of the two subtropical species during non-Nino events and CP Ninos, because both of these show instances of sometimes fairly significant increases in these species um, during these periods. But of course, I will note that my GAMs did not include any aspect of advection. And so um, I think it's a question of, again, kind of how much will species, these subtropical species be advected into the region versus how much will they kind of hold on and continue to proliferate as we potentially see uh, warming of the system and other associated changes. So I think, I think the jury, jury is still very much out on, on future changes. Um, we, I've tried to get us a little bit closer, but I think there's still a lot to do to, to sort of 
make our future predictions. So coming back to my question, I went through a lot of things related to El Nino, and I'm just coming back to summarize kind of what I saw from the Southern California current zooplankton community. Again, I really saw the most consistent impacts of El Nino event at the species level and kind of some of the taxonomic groups and species within those in terms of consistent biomass changes and community compositional changes. And the euphausids in particular um, showed this really strong El Nino response and even kind of differential EP and CP responses, which allowed me to, to try to get at some of the mechanisms. And then we do see this current resilience to El Nino, but I think um, you know, there's a lot to be done to, to continue to understand future changes. So that was part one. Um, now I'm gonna go into part two and don't worry, it's much shorter because as I said, this is my postdoc work. So I'm really only just now getting into this. But part two focuses much more on seasonal cycles and um, interannual variability in seasonal changes um, as kind of as seasonal changes influence the Northern California current zooplankton community and particularly the spring upwelling transition. So now I'm moving north to Oregon and uh, specifically to the Newport hydrographic line, which is right off our shores here in Newport. And what I'm focusing on again is this winter to spring transition in the zooplankton community of the Northern California current. And a lot of people have spent a lot of time trying to understand the summer zooplankton community, the spring and summer zooplankton, because um, they, they can really impact things like salmon foraging. You have um, juvenile or yearling salmon come out to the sea and, and start to feed. Um, and so people want to know how those are related. And also the winter community, um, a lot of fishes will spawn in the winter and so that larval fishes will be feeding on zooplankton. Um, and again, this is, I'm still getting up to speed on all of this. So um, I'm always happy to talk more about what the fish are doing or maybe more to listen to what the fish are doing from other people. But my questions are, first of all, related to this winter community, do we see any winter preconditioning for summer? So does what the community is doing in winter, does that have any impact on the, the subsequent spring and summer community? And um, if so, if there is any link, that can be really beneficial because it kind of gives us that much more time to, to be able to predict the subsequent spring and summer if, if we can look at the winter and sort of you know, predict what's going on in the subsequent months. Um, but also the winter community um, is maybe important prey for what I'm calling these range expanding fishes. And, what I mean are things like Pacific hake and sardine that ranged much farther north in winter 2015-16 than they had really ever done before. And so presumably they were feeding on things. And um, I think you know, these questions are important to look at what they were feeding on, kind of how, how successful that was, um, what might happen if, if those range exp expansions happen again in the future. And then related to the spring transition itself, I'm interested in these questions of the timing of spring, um, the spring transition, really the timing of upwelling onset, the durations of upwelling events, and um, kind of the multitude of upwelling, kind of trying to quantify how that all ties to the zooplankton community. So for example, we can see upwelling events in February, but are those enough to induce this transition to a spring zooplankton community? Are they too early? Do we need, does the zooplankton need to have upwelling occur in April or May? Do they need to have a, a month of upwelling? Um, what are, are there sort of specific characteristics that will induce changes in the zooplankton community? And, or are there other physical drivers that, that we can identify that sort of induce um, shifts in the zooplankton? And so I'm looking at three components. Um, first of all, the total zooplankton, and these are just very preliminary things to look at, but here's an MDS plot of, of um, major taxonomic groupings within the zooplankton community. They do show this kind of distinct summer community, um, shown by the blue triangles, compared to fall and winter spring. And then this is not surprising, it's known, but you know it's still nice to see. Um, and then also if we look at 
near shore in H5 as shown in these triangles versus farther offshore in H25, we do again see these, these community distinctions. And again, this is not a huge surprise, but um, it's, you know, it's valuable to see these patterns and, and I'm working to kind of tease apart more about what we can understand. And then second, I'm, I'm looking at the copepods. A lot of work has already been done and is being done on the copepods, uh, particularly on the copepod community. Here, I'm, I'm just showing MDS scores of the copepod community and therefore each of the 25 years in the time series, you can see some nice cyclicality. Um, there's, a, there's kind of a higher score in summer compared to winter and fall. Um, but one of my goals is to really see whether I can identify certain indicator species, um, individual species that really respond clearly to changes in the physical habitat. And then finally for the euphousids, um, looking at kind of their timing of spring onset. So we know that the euphousids really increase in biomass in spring. Here I'm showing proportion plots um, for the total zooplankton community. I know I don't have a legend, but all you need to really look at is this cyan color, that's the euphousid group. And you can see that there's this pretty clear spring onset of euphousid dominance. Um, and then in 2010, which was coincidentally an El Nino year, there was a much later onset of euphousids. And so trying to identify that timing and sort of um, determine how it relates to physical um, changes. So just to wrap that up, my next steps are again, really continuing to quantify the spring transition in the zooplankton, um, when they're happening, kind of which, which uh, taxa are showing changes within the copepods and euphousids, can we see indicator species and then tying all of this into some of the forcing mechanisms. And then um, I would like at some point to draw in additional surveys. NOAA does various types of surveys um, that have varying degrees of zooplankton coverage. And so I think it would be great to expand some of the spatial coverage if possible um, and kind of see how other areas relate to the Newport line. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I thank you to everyone who has already been supporting me and, and to many more who will be. I have my email down here at the bottom. If you'd like to get in touch, um, just note the double L in my last name and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so very much, Laura. I appreciate that. Uh, for anybody online, oh, you're getting applauses and thank yous and actually wave emojis, which is awesome. I didn't know you could do that. Um, but very cool. Um, for everybody online, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and put them in the chat for Laura. Um, if they are details, you talked a little bit, um, Laura, about um, collaboration opportunities as you're kind of finding your footing here. So for everybody that is doing, I mean, the work that Laura is doing is broad and has a lot of potential um, interactions. So I think that um, for folks that are here, if you'd like to reach out to her specifically, you can see that her contact information is on the screen. Um, I also, uh, as we're just kind of Kind of wrapping things up and giving folks a chance to put in questions. I just wanted to remind any students that we have online, um, there will be a discussion after uh, we have Craig and Zoe that will be doing a discussion. Um, and it's a separate link, but you all have that information, but just a reminder that you'll be able to continue this conversation along those lines um, when we get done. So I'm not seeing questions come in, so I have a couple of questions. Um, and since this isn't my area of expertise, forgive me if uh, others already know the answers, but you alluded a little bit on your part one about um, differentiating between adults and juveniles and the patterns that you saw. Um, and I was just wondering if that is something that um, you're thinking about doing as you look at um, part two and bringing it to Oregon um, and, and why that's important to, to kind of explore. Definitely, yeah, that's a great question. And I, I always get really excited and we're always really lucky when we do have that um, differential identification of different developmental stages because um, it does, it can allow us to infer something about active reproduction or, or at least survivability of some of these more larval stages. Um, and so yes, um, various people have done a lot of good work with the euphousids, um, I, think we, I think we mainly have developmental enumerations for the euphousids. We might also have them for copepods, but some people have looked at uh, various stages for euphousids, but um, I certainly at some point, if it 
you know, if I can, it would be interesting to kind of bring some of that work in, um, particularly to see if the larval stages are, if they show this kind of onset that might suggest increased reproduction um, in response to, to certain conditions or at certain times, so definitely. So uh, again, kind of um, building on that in a slightly different way, um, you're now working with a different data set with different strengths and weaknesses um, between the Cal Coffee and the Newport line. Um, and for folks that maybe are online that aren't as familiar with those two different, can you talk a little bit about the strengths and weaknesses of those two uh, data sets? Because they are different. Yes, that's a great point. Um, so the Cal Coffee data set is, is really sort of famous for its long, duration, it covers over 70 years now, which, which was really what allowed me to look at El Nino responses, because El Nino events themselves often only occur every, um, we say every three to eight years, but so there, there can be a, a large amount of time in between El Nino events, but having zooplankton coverage across 70 years allowed me to really look at El Nino signals um, within the kind of larger non-Nino uh, background. And so that is a huge strength of Cal Coffee. And then again, this, this extensive spatial grid for, um, well, first of all, spatial coverage, known spatial coverage for all of these taxa, we can at least say that they're representative of the Southern California region. And then for the Ufausids, Ufausids actually having that um, space, spatial resolution is, is just a huge bonus. But the thing that Cal Coffee does not have and that actually people have really been dis discussing about how we can bring in is high temporal resolution. So Cal Coffee, I mean, at most Cal Coffee samples four times per year, which is already incredible. I, I never mean to speak ill of that. Um, it's, it's phenomenal to have quarterly sampling, but for the zooplankton, we don't even have, we only have enumerations once a year. So um, it's really hard. I actually didn't talk about this part at all, but I'm, I'm trying to, or I'm doing, particle backtracks of Ufausid distributions from spring to the preceding winter. And, but, but I, can't, I can't sort of compare those to actual winter distributions because we don't have enumerations of the wintertime distributions. And so I can't, all I can sort of say is where the source waters came from. I can't actually say where the Ufausids, whether they came from where we think they came from. So that lack of temporal resolution is really a limitation. And that's a huge benefit of the Newport line because Newport line samples every other week. I didn't say this, but probably a lot of you know, the Newport line has basically bi-weekly sampling twice a month, um, which is just incredible resolution and allows, it, that's really what allows me to, um, to better pinpoint things like this onset of the spring upwelling transition, which which can vary you know, by a couple of weeks, but that can make a big difference. And so having that high temporal resolution is huge. And also if we can link that Newport line, which is only one line, if we can link it to some of the broader scale surveys um, that cover more spatial distribution, that, that would make it sort of even more um, beneficial. Thank you. We do have a couple of questions coming in. I don't know if you have your chat open or if you would like me to um, yes, First I okay. came in by Kim. Kim. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just have to. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, Kim asked. Oh, Kim, you gave me a great setup for um, my long term changes. Ah, I'm trying to get to it. So, Kim asked It looks like you found that biomass over cow coffee has been increasing over time. Um, is that true? And if so, any ideas on mechanisms, increased abundance, or sizes, or both? Um, so yeah, that's a great question. I don't, I wish I had a backup slide, but we, what's interesting is we actually see long-term increases in the cool water Ufausid species, and we don't see increases, long-term increases in the subtropical species. So um, that's, that's kind of in contrast to some of the findings of subtropicalization of the fish community off Southern California. Um, and I think maybe some of the other components of zooplankton, but the Ufausids, at least the, the cool water species seem to really be increasing long-term. Um, and that's a good question about sizes or abundance. I don't know that we know from Cal Coffee. Right now, we really only identify stages. We don't, I don't think we measure individuals. Um, my, but my, my sense is that it's at least partly increased abundance, maybe also increased size. Um, and I think it may be due to the fact that we have been seeing stronger upwelling um, over the past two decades in the California current and, and really 
overall highly productive conditions. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting question and, and something I'd like to delve into more. So thank you for that. And then I'm- Okay, yep, next question you had is from Michael. Okay, about... resilience of, oh yeah, yeah. Resilience of cool water assemblage is um, perplexing. Um, and then particularly are the warm water phases more common um, and any additional details and mechanisms. Yeah, so I think this kind of ties into the same thing. I was also surprised by this, the resilience of this cool water or sort of resident community to El Nino. Although I think it makes sense if you know you think about El Nino events have been happening to the system for who knows how long. So the system has kind of evolved. I think it just speaks to um, to the ability of even kind of reduced populations to to begin reproducing again under reversals to favorable conditions. So these colder water species, even if they kind of decrease temporarily, when the conditions turn favorable again, they presumably they can keep or they can reproduce again and sort of build back up. At least that's my assumption about what is what is going on. Um, and then the warm water phases, I think, are more just they sort of can't sustain themselves following um, turn, turns to cool water. OK, so I'm, I think Rick Broder is the next one. Yep. Oh, I'll make it. I'm just going to make this bigger. Um, Rick asks, you had mentioned that the overall zooplankton biomass did not seem to decrease during ENSO events, but copepods and euphacids both do. Um, so that would suggest that some other zooplankton taxa increase to make up the difference. And um, that is exactly right, Rick. Thank you for bringing that up. Well, I, I think it's right. Um, so we do see, I know particularly during 1983, we saw um, a, a significant increase in salps. And so those likely made up the biomass that, that a lot of these other taxa were showing as decreasing. Um, that's not to say, I did not find a significant um, uh, relationship of salps with El Nino events. So the salps did not always increase during El Nino, but um, yet to some degree, I think there was, you know, there is kind of maybe increases in certain taxa to kind of make up for others. Although I don't have, I can't really speculate beyond that, but thank you for bringing that up. And it looks like there's one more, sorry, cinnamon um, cut me off. If we... Yep, no, it's okay. And okay. our uh, Megan has asked a question. Okay. Um, so Megan asked, it is fascinating to me that the NCC copobod community never underwent the typical biological transition in 2015 and 2016. Do you have any ideas about how you will address this as you study the effects of the physical spring transition? Um, it's a great question. It's putting me a little bit on the spot <laughs> in terms of what I'm planning to do. Um, yeah, I think this is, this is something that has really been well described by Bill Peterson and um, everyone who's worked with him, Jennifer and Cheryl and everyone. The fact that we, that, that um, the NCC saw a lot of unusual or copepod species in these warm years. Um, and I think, so my goal here is really to, to kind of treat every year similarly to some extent and be blind now to things like El Nino events and just look at what the conditions were in 2015 and 2016 um, as they kind of differed from other years and and just look across all years and sort of see um, you know to what extent upwelling happened or didn't happen and how that might explain things. Um, I'm planning to look at things like the um, the eight degree temperature isotherm kind of the depth of that which can also be an indicator of upwelling um, things like subsurface oxygen may have an impact. So I don't really know which physical variables are gonna shake out as the most important, but um, my goal now is to, to kind of just look across all years rather than focusing on El Nino events. So, oh, um, yeah. This is, thanks, Kate, yeah. wait to hear more about your work. And I think that's probably true of all of us. We're excited that you're here and um, we'll have to get a follow-up uh, when you when you get done and you uh, can present again to us. So um, for everybody online, I think we're gonna wrap up right there. Uh, I hope you join us next week um, when Alejandro comes to speak with us. And if you are interested in um, are part of our student group or our um, postdocs, you can uh, join the post chat um, and keep the conversation going. And for Laura, thank you so much for sharing with us the work that you're doing and um, 
giving us a preview on the work that you will be doing as you are here. And again, folks are coming in and saying thank you so much. And uh, we really appreciate your work. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, we'll see you again next week. And Laura, we'll see you again at some time and hopefully face to face soon as you find your way back up to, or to Newport for us. So we'll see everybody later. Thank you.